Hallelujah. Would you stand to your feet right now in honor of the man of God and the reading of the word of God. We do stand. Amen. Thank God for the leadership of our bishop, Brother Dylan. God bless him in Jesus. Put your hands together and give the Lord praise, shall we? Come on, somebody just shout to the Lord a little bit right now. Come on, if God's been good to you, you ought not be ashamed of his goodness. Come on, I said you ought to celebrate the goodness of the Lord right now. Hallelujah, how many God's been good to you and you're not ashamed of the goodness of the Lord? Oh, when I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, my soul can't help it. I'm sorry, I gotta cry out hallelujah. Praise God for saving me. You ought to celebrate God's goodness in your life. If the Lord's been good to you, how can you be silent about God's goodness when your soul's wanting to cry hallelujah? Oh, yes, Lord, my soul's wanting to say something. My soul's wanting to do something, praise God. I'm excited about what the Lord is doing, and uh, we are so thankful for his blessings, and <laughs> I'm thankful for his mercies, praise God. Amen, praise God. I know we've got some folks here today that's excited about God's mercies. Brother Hobson's glad for God's mercies. Wave your hand, Brother Hobson, real big. Amen. Had a heart attack. The doctor said you're five minutes from them digging a hole and putting you in it. Amen. I'm here to tell you, thank God for the mercies of the Lord. Hallelujah. Not one heart attack, but two. We ought to celebrate God's goodness. And guess what? He's here today. Somebody say hallelujah. I said he's here today. And we ought to celebrate hallelujah. Amen. You may not shout, but I tell you what, he, he just allowed me to have a Holy Ghost spell right now. You may not move, but he, he just allowed me to move today. I'm here to tell you, our God is an awesome God and glorious God. Hallelujah. Amen. The book of 2 Kings chapter number 9, or rather chapter 2, verse number 9. If you have your Bibles and would care to follow along with us, I have a word from the Lord today that I feel that the Lord has put in my spirit. You know, the older you get, you, you, really, you really stop and think about what you will leave behind. And uh, I'm not just talking about goods. I'm not just talking about stuff. What will you leave behind as a legacy of your being here? I hope you just don't think you just came and went and, amen, not going to leave anything behind. I hope you know that you will leave something more than goods that will perish. Somebody say praise the Lord. 2 Kings chapter 2, begin reading at verse 9. And it came to pass when they were gone over that Elijah said unto Elisha, Ask what I shall do for thee before I be taken away from thee. Now, how many would like the opportunity to just ask for a spiritual inheritance I'm talking about just ask and know that it could possibly happen to you. Wave your hand to the Lord. Praise God. And Elijah said, I pray thee, <laughs> exactly what I'd have prayed and you'd have prayed, let a double portion. Wait a minute. Did he say God's spirit? He said, I want a double portion of thy spirit. Be upon me. Now, when I read that, that sort of threw me a little bit. Now, why would he want Elijah's spirit on him? Because Elijah had a spirit that was contagious. He had a spirit that was so magnanimous that it just that the people were drawn to him and the power of God was upon him. That's why he wanted that spirit. Mm. Look at verse number 11. And it came to pass as they still went on. Everybody say, I'm glad they're moving on. And talk that, behold, there appeared a chariot of fire and horses of fire and parted them both asunder. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. What a way to go. And Elisha saw it. And something in him that I, I cannot escape from. He cried, my father, my father, 
the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. And he saw him no more. And he took hold of his own clothes and rent them in two pieces and took up also the mantle of his father, Elijah, that fell from him and went back and stood. He stood by the bank of Jordan. And he took the mantle of Elijah that fell from him and smote the waters and said, Where is the Lord God of my daddy? Elijah, <laughs> I just got an inheritance that I'm fixing to exercise. I just got some impartation that I'm fixing to, I'm fixing to see if it works or not. Uh, somebody say hallelujah. <laughs> Woo! And when he also had spent the waters, they parted hither and thither. I don't know where the hither and thither is, but it went, friend. And Elisha just walked right on over. I'm going to preach today maybe a little bit different on the subject. Matter of fact, I've got two subjects. I, I just, I'm sort of, I feel like a lizard on Paisley. I don't know which way to turn. I'm preaching on who is your daddy. Or Elisha's tragedy. Now put your Bible down, raise your hands, and we're going to ask the Holy Ghost to speak to people today. Because I'm going to tell you what you need more than you need a raise on the job. You need a word from God. And if you don't get a, if you don't get a, if you don't get a word from God, sir, I, I feel for you, and I feel for your family, and I feel for your future, and I feel for your destiny. And I'm asking God right now to help us. Come on, raise your hands. Reach over and grab a hand and hold it up right now in Jesus' name. Would you do that? In the name of the Lord, I thank you today for what's going to happen. I thank you today for what's happening right now in the spirit world. There's something powerful being transferred even right now. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Oh, God. Hallelujah. We thank you today and praise you right now in Jesus' name. We glorify you, Lord, in the name of the Lord. Praise God. Now put your hands together and give God some praise and thank him right now. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Turn to your neighbor and ask him a question. Who is your daddy? <laughs> Well, you can be seated. God bless you is our prayer. I think one of life's greatest disappointments is unfulfilled promises. Now, how many here has been given some promises from the Lord? Come on, wave your hand real big. Now, if you've been given promises, don't just sit there. You need to exercise. Amen. And full. Hey, just go ahead and affirm this question. I have been given some promises of God that you haven't seen fulfilled yet. I said, you haven't seen it yet, but you know it's going to happen in Jesus' name because God said it and God can't lie. I said, God said it and God can't lie. The Bible said in him is yea and amen. You see, he's got the yea, but you've got to have the amen. If you don't have the amen, he ain't got the yea. In other words, the yea is with Jesus, but the amen's with you. In other words, amen means so be it. Amen, has anybody got a so be it? It's going to happen. Come on, in him is yea, but somebody's got to get a hold of an amen right now. I need somebody to say amen. Come on, somebody say amen, praise God. Woo, hallelujah. But you see, unfulfilled promises is not God's fault anyway. Amen, the fulfilling of the promise is up to us. And Jesus, you know, he, he taught us the principle of all of this in the parable of the talents that we're taught that individuals do have varying degrees of gifts. And we're also told that to much is given, much is what? Required. God spoke to Israel through Haggai the prophet saying, you look for much, but indeed it came too little because you were trying to do it without me. Now understand one thing. You will not do anything without God. If you think you go succeed without God, you're crazy. You'll never go succeed without the Lord. You cannot succeed without his help. 
And God spoke similar words to Isaiah of unfulfilled promises. And, and when I read it, he said, it was all regarding Israel and his vineyard. He said, behold, my beloved has a vineyard and a very fruitful hill. He digged it and cleared out stones and planted it with the choicest vine. He built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press it. He expected to bring forth good grapes, but it brought forth wild grapes. Then I want you to notice what he said in Isaiah 5 and 4. What more could be done more to my vineyard? What else could I do, hey amen, that I have not done yet? I, I want you to know beyond a shadow of a doubt that God is working on his vineyard. He's working on his church. Hey, he's working on us to get us ready for what he's been preparing for us all the time. Hey, do you understand God's working on you? I mean, it's glad God's working on me. He's not through working on me. He's going to keep working on me. I said God's working upon his people in this last day. This is not some spin the wheel or chance happening or let's make a deal. This is God trying to prepare this generation to be recipients of his power and his promises. Jesus said, this generation shall not pass away. He's talking about this generation, folks. It is not going to pass away lest all these things be fulfilled. And one of those fulfillments of the last day is that the spirit of Elijah would come. You hear me? Amen. Elijah was the beginning of the prophetic mantle that would be passed down. He was not the end, but he was the beginning. He had a purpose in that day just like he does today. The Bible says, speaking of Elijah, amen, that he found Elisha, the son of Saphat, plowing 12 yoke of oxen. Now let me tell you, when God wants to find you, he's going to find you. You hear me? The purpose of God and the call of God will find you and you will not get away from it. You cannot escape the call of God and you will never get away from the purpose of God. You see, Elijah's plans were to continue the family lineage of the family business. His father was a farmer. His father's father was a farmer. All the way down through generations, it was passed on to him that, that he was going to be a farmer just like his daddy. But let me tell you one day, the Bible said that the, the prophet of God, Elijah, pulled his bony finger to heaven and said it's not going to rain for three and a half years. Let me tell you, now that, that spells doom for a farmer. No rain, no crop, no water, no harvest. And friend, this spelled doom, amen, for Elisha and all of his dreams and aspirations. Let me tell you, folks, God knows how to turn the waterworks off to get you back to his will. I'm going to say that again. God knows how to turn the waterworks off to get you right back to his purpose. He knows how to find you. In other words, the Bible said that Elisha, the son of Saphat, was out plowing 12 yoke of oxen. And across the no trespassing sign, hey man, here comes, hey man, a weird looking man with a mantle that was blowing in the breeze. Hey man, his hair blowing in the breeze, his eyes like a flame of fire. And he just walks by him and takes his mantle and casts that mantle upon him and said, follow me. Let me tell you that when the call of God comes and the mantle is passed on to you, you can't escape that. I don't care what you try to do. Are you listening to me? You'll never get away from God's purpose and God's power and God's divine plan. Amen. You see, something happened in that field that day. Amen. Elisha, he stopped everything. That old faithful oxen had plowed with him down through the years. Because three and a half years, you got to understand, no rain. I'm about to say no rain. God have mercy. No rain. F three and a half, but he woke up every morning. And that old oxen, he hooked them up. And out in the fields, he would go to try to hang on. People try to hang on to things that God's trying to get you to turn loose of. So he took that plow, and right in the middle of the field, he broke it. He piled it 
up in a pile and set it to fire. He took that bone handle knife and he walked forward and the brown eyed Haman uh, oxen looked at him. The faithful oxen looked at him. But Elisha said, I'm sorry. I got to sever ties with this world. I can't stay here. There's something bigger than this calling me. And he plunged that knife in the jugular vein. And there that day he severed ties with the past. Are you listening to me? There comes a time, amen, that God knows what row you're plowing. And he knows how to walk that row. And he knows how to get your attention. And he knows how to turn you around. And he knows how to make, oh, God, I need some help up in this house right now. When you think of Elisha, what do you think of? We think of the miraculous. The River Jordan opening, widow's, the widow's meal and all was replenished. <laughs> Naaman's leprosy healed. Elisha, he fed some prophets who had caved in. Haman, they were in a cave. The servants, Haman's eyes were open to see the host of the Lord. And it surrounded the city, remember. The widow's son was revived back, amen, again, and delivered back to his mother. The council of the host of the king of Syria was revealed by Elisha. Elisha caused an axe head to float. I mean, an axe head to come rising up out of the water. It was Elijah. Hey, Elijah, who struck blind the host of the king of Syria and all his army. All of these miraculous events that we read about came about because of who he followed. I said, because of who he followed. It all happened because something was imparted to him and handed down to him by one who was his leadership. Who was he following? He was following Elijah. But can I ask you, who are you following? Where is your leadership? Who, where is it taking you? Where is it carrying you? Who's leading your life today? Are you hearing me? You can't lead someone else to light while you're standing in the dark. I said you cannot lead people to light when you are standing in the dark. Elijah followed an anointing. He followed a man of God who was so anointed. Oh, and Elijah successfully transferred that anointing to Elisha. It was that transfer of anointing that actually released the miraculous. I want to ask all of you, how many would love to see the miraculous released in your life? I'm not thirsty. I'm just thinking, praise God, that some of you out there need to understand, I want that transfer. I want to see God use me in this last day. You just want to be a pew warmer? You just want to be a shade tree or a fruit tree? What do you want to be? Hey, man, do you want God to use you? For that to happen, there's got to be a transfer. There's got to be some impartation come into your life. And it all happens with the leadership that you're following. Who are you taking your cues from? The world or God? Flesh or the anointing of the Holy Ghost? What you want or what God wants? <laughs> Matter of fact, Elisha, the Bible said he had the spirit of Elijah. Matter of fact, Elisha asked for a double portion, not of God's spirit, but of Elijah's spirit. A double portion of Elijah's spirit. Why? Because spirits make men. And Elijah had a spirit that could plug into God's spirit. It's going to get quiet today. It's going to get as so quiet as a mouse licking ice. But I'm here to tell you, somebody today needs to hear what I'm saying. Elijah passed on his spirit to Elisha. Listen, friend, it's more than just what a preacher says. You listen to me. It's more than his homiletics. It's more than his hermeneutics. It's more than his oratory or his verbiage. It is his spirit that has to reach you. When the spirit of the preacher reaches for you and touches you, something happens. You see, there is an anointing that goes beyond flesh and blood. There is an anointing that goes beyond what you look at here. You see, the preachers that years ago, the old-time preachers didn't have great educations. 
No, sir. I'm going to tell you, when I got into Pentecost 47 years ago, matter of fact, a lot of them did not even finish high school. They had to, they had to work to help feed the family. But they had a relationship with God that was so magnanimous that you couldn't get away from it. You see, it's not just some eloquent dressed man of God that could stand up and give you oratorical ability, but it's a man of God whose spirit reaches for you every time you walk in the church house that he's trying to portray his spirit into your spirit. I, I won't never forget one of the old preachers got up, Brother Nevin, and preached. He read the scripture said, I'll make your feet like hinds' feet that walks in high places. He read, I'll make your feet like hen's feet. And he preached on a three-toed religion. Three go forward and one back. That's what a chicken toe does. A three-toed chicken toed religion he preached about. He man, they got one that'll keep you from backsliding is what he was talking about. Honey, I know, I, I know that wasn't hermeneutically correct. I know that that wasn't exactly what it said, but it wasn't what he said. It was who he was. It was a spirit, and I'm not glorifying ignorance. You hear me? I'm just trying to tell you that that man of God was so passionate that there was something about him that his spirit just got a hold of you and you could not help yourself. Do you think the church just woke up one day and got where it is? There was a lot of the old time preachers years ago. I will never forget one man of God got up and preached on the seven squeezes of Elijah. And honey, he was running around squeezing people and they was falling out in the spirit. I'm talking, he just run up and squeezed folks and the Holy Ghost fall on them. Woo! He just run up and squeezed somebody in the power of God. Now we know the Bible said that the prophet sneezed and not squeezed. But it was not the fact that, that we're not glorifying the ignorance. I'm just telling you. But there was a spirit of impartation in these men that had been hours down in the woods fasting and praying that walked in that church house and honey with the eyes of a flame of fire was imparting something to a people that was more than words, more than a, listen, you got a lot of preachers that preach pretty sermons, but you don't get one flip out of it. Are you hearing me? You don't know what they preached the, the five minutes after you walked out. But I'm going to tell you, hey man, when an old man of God walked up, hallelujah, and there's a divine impartation, you'll never get away from that. You can't get away from that. It's too powerful to get away from. It's too powerful to escape from, praise God. When the spirit of the preacher can connect with you and you feel his passion and you feel his burden and you feel he's real, he's not putting on, he's trying to take you somewhere. He's trying to lead you past carnality, past the world. He's trying to save your babies. He's trying to save your family. He's trying to get you out of hell, praise God. I want this to be more than a church that just comes and has pretty sermons preached. I can preach you one. Don't you think I can't preach you one? But I prayed yesterday right here. I said, God, if we're going to combat the demons of hell of this last day, if you're going to battle the forces that's coming after your faith, your family, and your finances, you are going to have to have more than a pretty song and a pretty sermon. You Listen, folks, we got to have more than just coming to church and panicking for Jesus. Somebody's got to get up and understand that there is a spirit of the preacher that's trying to get to you, that's trying to reach you, that's trying to get into your soul. (laughs) 
If you could see in my heart right now, you'd see a man of God that says, I want, I want these children saved. I want this generation saved. I want to pass on apostolic authority. I want to see the power of God move. I want to see demonstrations, signs, and wonders, and miracles in this last day. And if you don't want that, you're dismissed right now because that's exactly what God's trying to lead us to. Praise God. The church at Corinth was full of sin. Where people not living like they needed to live. Paul told them, what did Paul do? Some of you look at me like I'm supposed to be Mr. Enforcer. That I'm Sherlock Dillon. I got a hound's tooth cap and a magnifying glass. And I'm going to say after further deductions. Watson, I'm not going to snoop into your life. I'm not going home with you, but let me talk to you about one who is. I tell you who you hide it from, you hide it from nobody. You may hide it from me, but you'll never hide it from him. And he that covereth his sin shall not prosper. You may be prospering now, but you hold on, honey. It ain't over yet. I said, it's not over yet. I said, when God gets through, you'll understand more about it when he gets through. But Paul told that church, here's what he told them. 1 Corinthians 4, 15. For though you have... 10,000 instructors in Christ, you have not many what? I can't hear you. For in Christ Jesus, I have begotten you. Who begot you? Paul said, I have begotten you through the gospel. Jesus saves you, but Paul said, I have begotten you. Verse 16 said, wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. Am I perfect? A long way from being perfect. But do I want to take this church to the next level? Yes, I do. But I'm here to tell you I cannot take you there until you recognize one thing. Let me tell you what. When, when I looked at this scripture, he said you have many teachers but one father. The word teacher in the Greek means boy leader. You have a lot of boy leaders. But you hear me, if I'm going to affect you, I've got to become more than a boy leader. I've got to become a father figure. I'm preaching on who is your daddy. Oh, you hear me? i got to be a father figure. Because when daddy speaks, children listen. Or at least it was in my house. I'd beat all the hide off their back yonder. I know you got this new philosophy, time out. The only time out I had was knockout. You hear me? I'd knock them out. That's the only language they understood. Pray. Oh, I, testing one, two, three. I got a bunch of limp wrists back there that need to stand up, be the man of your house, and quit letting your children run you. Oh, I'm going to get tough right now because I feel some resistance in this place. And some of you need to stand up and be men and be the leaders of your house. You need to get out in the aisle and shout and show your babies how to worship. Come on. Thank God we don't need any boy leaders. We need some fathers. We need some fathers to stand up, praise God, and be the daddy you're supposed to be to your family, praise God. And that's more than just putting food on the table and clothes on their back. It has to be a spiritual influence and a spiritual leader to those children that God gave you. Hallelujah. Woo! That's why. When Elijah was taken by a fiery chariot, 2 Kings 2.12, when he was taken, Elisha saw it and cried. It'd be like if they called you and they found me dead. My father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof, he saw him no more. And he said, my God, i got to get this off of me. This is me. 
back. He tore his clothes and rent them in two pieces to God. And you know what he did? The next verse said, hey, man, something happened. He put on the mantle that Elijah had successfully. Everybody say successfully. Mm, mm, mm. He was saying, I, I have no father but you. You know, I'm going to be truthful with you. I won't ever be your pastor that I become your spiritual father. Right. I'm not trying to usurp authority. I just want you to feel my spirit, okay? Because God is taking us somewhere, and there's going to have to be confidence. These boys never wondered. One day, will there be food on the table? It may not have been what they wanted. It may not have been what, listen, I'm not trying to glorify me, but I built more than just this church. I built another one, and we're building one now. I know what sacrifice is all about. I've been there and done that. I'm not going about what I did. It don't help anybody, but I'm just trying to tell you I've been there and done that. Got faded T-shirt. And somebody needs to recognize one thing today. If I don't become your spiritual father, I can never be your truthful leader. That's why Paul said in Romans 8 and 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the, verse 15, for you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, what? Abba, what? Father! Verse 16, <laughs> Woo, for the Spirit is out bear witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. Verse 7, and if children then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. We are recipients of an inheritance. And verse 19 said, for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation. This world is waiting, people. For the manifestation, not the manifestation of Pentecostals, not the manifestation of a denomination, not the manifestation of some peculiar religion. No, sir. He's waiting for the manifestation of the sons of God. He's waiting for somebody to drop up and say, I'm a father. Hey, man, I'm making a dedication today. I'm making a commitment today. Hallelujah. Hey, come on, somebody. It's wait for manifestation. Somebody needs to get a manifestation in your life. If you want to see God manifested in your life and in your families, I'm asking you, who is your daddy? What is your leadership? Who are you taking your cues from? Where is your power coming from? Hey, somebody ought to shout right now. Praise God. That's why it's a, it's a dangerous thing for people not to tie themselves. We've got a lot of folks that's untied. And God's got a warrant out for your arrest today. Ezra 2.62 said, These sought their register among those that were reckoned by genealogy. Now here come the people coming into the land of promise. Hey, man, trying to get their inheritance. And here, he said, well, I'll tell you how you're going to get your inheritance. you got to be reckoned by genealogy. But they were not found. What? Read it. They were not found, therefore. Were they as what? Polluted. Put out of ministry. Every rendition from this own says they did not have the ability to minister. Why? Because they were not found with a father. They were stained, saw, disqualified. The difference in a revival church is I want da what daddy's got. That's what revival churches want. And every time I preach, I'm reaching for you, and I'm trying to pass on to you my spirit you can, you, let me tell you, you say, my God, he, is he always up? I'm always up. I'm always up. I try not to get down. Have I been knocked down? Yes, you didn't know it, but I was down. I was discouraged. I felt like, my God, 
I told my wife one Sunday morning, I said, I'm not going to church. I'm going to stay home and cook spaghetti, praise God. You ever been there? Come on, fella, I just rolled it on over. But something got into you said, Daddy's looking for me. I can't disappoint Daddy. Hey, Daddy wants to see me. Hey, Kashatoboi. I'm not trying to glorify me. Please, don't misinterpret what I'm saying. I'm not trying to glorify me as something. I'm not deifying myself. But Paul said, you follow me as I follow Christ. Did he say it? Come on now. You follow me. I'm just a man. I, I make mistakes, but I'm here to tell you. I'm living the best I know. I try to get up here every morning, hey amen, at 6 o'clock and pray. Hey amen. And I try to seek God and call your name and, and, and pray about situation. There's not one of you here I haven't called your name, your children's name, your family's name, and situation that you're dealing with right now. All right. I, I'm going to tell you, I feel like having a Holy Ghost breakout right now. I feel like somebody in the house needs to understand and ask yourself the question, who is your daddy? Hey, man, who is? Are you in the genealogy? Can your name be found? Hey, man, are you making a dedication? Are you making a commitment? Praise God. Hey, man, we got to have a revival church. Thank God that catches the, hey, man, that catches the spirit of the father. Proverbs 20, 27 says, the spirit of a man is a candle of the Lord searching all the inward parts of the belly. God picks up your spirit to get to the real you. You all got spirits. And if your spirit is all porcupine and all about you, you will never see the manifestation of miraculous. The spirit of Elijah was passed on to Elisha. Matter of fact, Malachi the prophet said in the last two verses of the Old Testament in Malachi 4, he said, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet for the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Verse 6 said, And he shall turn the heart of the fathers where? And the heart of the children where? If If that doesn't happen, I'm fixing to smite this earth with a curse. I'm fixing to curse this earth that we're on. You know what he's saying? If you don't find you a daddy and make a... Now, I know you all got natural daddies. And how many loves your natural father? Honey, I love mine is 88 years old. Amen. And I talk to him every Sunday morning at 730 and have done it for 40 years. Amen. Nobody can call that house, amen, at 730 but me. Somebody tried one time and my mama said, I can't talk to you. My boy's fixing to call and I'm not missing that call. And I tell my daddy, I told him this morning, I love you with all my heart. He said, I love you. And he, we both almost broke down and cried. Because I'm here to tell you, you got to have an allegiance, not just to your natural father, but you got to make up your mind. There is a spiritual father in my life. And if you don't find him, you'll go to hell. I promise you, you'll go to hell. I promise you, the devil will kick your teeth out. He'll kick your children's teeth out. He'll carry them down a primrose trail to drugs and alcohol. Amen. I'm going to tell you, and they, some of you think you're going to get by. You will pay a judge and you will pay a, a bail bondsman one day more than you ever paid time in your life. There's a curse coming to any family that doesn't direct your children. See that man up there preaching? That's your your father. That's your spiritual father. You call this cultish if you want to. It don't make any difference. This is Bible. And if you don't... This is something that can't be taught. It has to be caught. It can't be expressed. It has to be experienced. This can't be legislated. It has to be lived out. It has to get a hold of you. It has to get a hold of you. I believe, listen to me, there's some men I wouldn't follow nowhere. Any man tells you there's not a hell, you don't even, you, listen, you don't pay that Any man will tell you there's no such thing as standards in this Bible, you don't follow that man. Every building has walls. Every road has ditches. Everything's got some boundaries to it. Are you hearing me? 
If you think I'm going to back down on that, you've got another thought coming, praise God. Love doesn't say anything goes. I love my wife, but she will not have a date this Saturday night with somebody else. I love her, but love's got some limitations, praise God. You've got to draw a line in the sand somewhere, praise God. And I realize you can't legislate it. It's got to be lived out. But I'm asking you to look at leadership that God's given you. See how we look. See how we live. See what we do. And if you don't follow on with your daddy, what in the world... Anybody that, if daddy calls and you don't return it, what's he going to do? My daddy told me one time, I sassed him. He said, I brought you in and I can take you out. Huh? Brother, that's one thing you never did. You never did go. And let me tell you something else. If I went anywhere, he knew where I was at. Up to I was grown. Some of you missed church three or four times. I don't get a text. I don't know where you are. Who is your daddy? Oh, it's quiet today. Are you lonesome tonight? I'm so lonesome tonight. Oh, I'm lonesome up here right now. I need some help. Somebody ought to jump to your feet and say, yay. Woo, come on, somebody. Praise God. you what Elisha's tragedy was or just let me just explain to you maybe how his life came to a close same way yours will come to a close if it doesn't happen 2 Kings 13 19 he said the man of God was wroth with him and said thou shouldest have smitten the ground now let me tell you amen Verse 20, look at verse 20. And Elisha died. He died an angry old man looking for somebody to call him daddy. For somebody to leave a spiritual inheritance to. When something is not passed on, it dies. Elisha's tragedy was he wasn't able to transfer what was given to him. Just as he was in line to receive from Elijah, Gehazi was in line to receive the mantle from Elisha. But I never find where Gehazi ever called Elisha father. Even the, Go 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 the Gehazi, who, uh, who was eyewitness, he saw the miraculous power of God. He, he saw the raising of the Shunammite son. It was Gehazi who carried Elisha's staff and placed it on a dead boy that was raised back to life. If you saw that, what would happen? It was Gehazi who hears a strange noise and looks out and see beautiful a beautiful chariot with, with white plumed horses. Amen. Parked right out in front of Elisha's house. It was Gehazi who heard the knock on the door. And the prophet called and said, you go tell Naaman, the captain of the host of the king of Syria, to go dip seven times in Jordan. It was Gehazi who delivered that message that walked out. Amen. And Naaman was wroth and got mad and said, you tell that preacher to come out and pray for me. The, I got letters from the king of Israel that said he's going to heal me. And I'm expecting a healing. I, I want a healing right now. I'm going to tell you, we live in an instant gratifying world that wants theirs right now. It's instant grits. It's instant oatmeal. If the computer is a minute ca kicking on, my, you want to slap it. I mean, you, everybody wants everything right now. You go tell him that he better heal me. And Gehazi looked at him and said, I'm just delivering the book. I'm just the mailman. Don't whip me. Hey, man, I'm just delivering the mail. Go dip seven times. And brother, hey, man, he was there. We know the story of what happened. He looked and he was almost cussing when he left. Said, my God, I'm not dipping in that muddy river. It was Gehazi who saw the pain reached on his face because he was a leper. It was Gehazi who witnessed all of that. And all of a sudden, 
When long he heard the rumbling of chariots and the shout. He looked outside and he's having revival right in front of Elisha's house. All of a sudden, Haman, they're banging on the door. And it was Haman, it was Naaman. He was jumping up and down and saying, I'm healed. His old plume had been over with muddy water. He was sitting there. <laughs> he said, I'm healed. Look, look at my, my skin like a baby's skin. I don't have leprosy anymore. <laughs> and brother, hey man, but Gehazi didn't see all that. He saw the millions of dollars worth of gold. He saw the, the offering that he had brought. And when he looked and saw it, he said, Whoo, look at him. My ship done come in. We ain't going to have to walk no more. Hi, God, we can buy us a big chariot like that with fine horses. <laughs> Woo, my, 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 my. We're going we gonna to be strutting now. Hey, man, the preacher going to get some ties today, praise God. But the prophet of God spoke up and said, you tell him I don't want anything. Everybody say, it's not time. It's, let me tell you, it's not time. We're not going to take that now because it's not about that. Hey, man, it's not about all of that. Let me tell some of you need to tell your spirit. It's not time to let the flesh of this world destroy what God's got planned. It's not time for us to be lured away by the gods of this world. It's not time. Are you listening to me? You ought to tell yourself it's not time for all of these things to happen in my life. That's going to take me away from the kingdom of God and the church house. You ought to, listen, you ought to be more committed now than you've ever been committed. Somebody say it's not time. Come on, you ought to say it's not time. It's not time to get carnal. It's time to get spiritual. It's not time to backslide. It's time to get in the church. It's not time to go to hell. I'm not taking my family to hell. It's time to get in here and have a move of the Holy Ghost. Woo, somebody say it's not time. Come on, just reach over, look over at somebody, run over to somebody, tell me it's not time, it's not time. Hey, he looked a shot to buy. But Gehazi's where some people are today. And I'm winding down. Gehazi was in a one generational pursuit. I'm gonna say it. He was in a one generational pursuit. Any person that I'm preaching to that all you're thinking about is now and what you want to do it pleasing your flesh that will destroy you and your family forgetting there's more to this than just you you gotta you gotta pursue what you want God to do you live you live like you want to thinking of nobody but self Look at somebody and tell them it's not time. It's not time to run after the security of the world. It's not time to lose focus on what God's called us to do. He allowed the miraculous to become the mundane and the calls to become common. Please don't let the calls become common. <laughs> don't let coming to church become a drudgery to you. You ought to jump up and say, I was glad. There's a joy, a thrill in my heart to come to God's house. Well, I love to feel the power of God. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. How many loves to feel the power of God? How many loves to feel the anointing of the Holy Ghost? Woo! Hallelujah! Hallelujah! Come on, you can't afford to lose this thrill, to forget about a spiritual inheritance and to seek after earthly riches. Don't, don't lose your thrill. Don't lose the joy. Don't, don't lose your worship. Don't lose that enthusiasm that's caused this church to grow and be what it's supposed to be. Don't let hell rob you and blind you of God's purpose, of what heaven wants to do. Don't be a one-generational pursuit. All you're thinking about is you. What about your babies? What about the grandchildren? If you don't live right and walk right, what do you think they're going to do? All hell to break through in their lives. you got to stand up and say, I refuse to be a one-generational pursuer. I am going to seek the things of the future. I'm going to tell you he sought after the riches. He sought after all of things. But here's what he got. 2 Kings 5, 27. The leprosy therefore of Naaman shall cleave to thee, 
Gehazi. And uh, uh, here's what hurts. And shall cleave unto thy seed for how long? And he went out from his presence a leper as white as snow. His actions not only affected him, but infected the whole generation of children and grandchildren. What you got to understand, people, are you listening to me today? This is more than just a move of God. This is a flow of divine impartation that God wants to put an allegiance back in you to understand that your father owns it all. How many understands that? He's in charge of it all. How many understands that? How many understand that he's got his hands on the spigot that controls all blessings in you, your family, your children and grandchildren? How many understands that? But you receiving your inheritance is determined by what happens with your dedication here. If you're not committed here, God will not be committed there. If you're not devoted here, God will not be devoted there. You, all of you want it to be blessed out there. Out there, I need raises and I need God and I need, oh God, I need new houses and lands and oh my God, I need I do, I need, and we, I don't, I don't begrudge it. I want you to be blessed. But understand, it can't, it, listen, you can't be blessed out there and fall apart in here. You can't, you can't lose allegiance here and expect God to keep allegiance there. You can only prosper as your soul prospers. If it, your soul don't prosper, there is no prosperity other than that. I'm going to clap your hands. It ought to happen right now. Woo! Somebody ought to shout right now. Hey, I want God to renew my allegiance. I've never done this in all my life. And I really don't know why I'm doing it now. It's going to take a little time. I want this side to rise. I want you to walk through here. I'm fixing to shake your hand. And I'm fixing to pray a blessing. As a father would pray upon his family. Come on. And it, I won't, you won't be long. Just pass through. I bless you. In the name of Jesus. Listen, listen, if you, don't, if you don't make allegiance to a spiritual father, I bless you. 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 I bless my children today. I bless you. I bless my children today. I bless you. 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 We're going to dedicate that baby in a few minutes, okay? I bless you, darling. I need you. I bless 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 you. This side, this area, please rise. It won't be but just a little while I'll be passing on this mantle to that boy right there. You better hear this preacher now. 
Remember what Elijah gave you. And don't let it die with Elisha. I bless you. I bless you. Who is your daddy? I bless you. Bless you. I love you. I love you. I bless you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. Bless you. I've never done this in all my ministry. Bless you. But I'm doing it now because I feel, bless you. There's got to be a connection. I love you. I bless you. Some of you won't be here a few years from now. But when you stand before Jesus in that judgment seat, I bless you today. Because the Bible said that I'm going to stand judged for you when I get to heaven. I'm going to be judged for every one of you. How many understands that? I bless you. How many understands that I'm going to be judged? I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Who Raise your hands. All of those that haven't walked through, raise your hands right now. The Lord's doing something. I love you. 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 right here. Nothing in this world will do. Woo! I love you, brother. I love you. Jesus, I love you. the
Praise God, praise God, praise God, praise God. Come on. Jesus, you're the center. Oh, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. So many children today are disillusioned. Many of them don't know how to cope in life because they have no father figure. They have nobody to call daddy. You know, that's the strength of a church. That's what makes a church what it is. When you can look up to someone that... It's not elevating them and making them some some deified individual. It's like I look to my father. I don't deify him, but I love him and respect him. And there's nothing I won't do, and I don't want to disappoint him. I'm asking some of you here today. Please don't disappoint your father. 
I've stepped out by faith for your families. We're building for your families and your future. Don't disappoint your father. How sad would it be for a child to wander away, bid farewell to his father and his mother. And when Christmas came and Thanksgiving is upon us and don't have anywhere to go, going to sit somewhere by himself and go to some fast food and just eat a sandwich when he could be sitting around the table with a father and mother. How valuable is that, my friend? Don't count this a little thing that God has placed you in the family for you to have a spiritual father. I preach today on who is your daddy. God love you. God bless you. Praise God. Pray. Brother Netherland, would you come pray? We love this man. I thank God for him, his life. He's another one. He's been there and done that. He's got an armor that's got chinks in it already. He knows where we are right now. And I thank God for this man's loyalty, this man's commitment and dedication. He has proven to everyone that this is the way.